Hi, welcome. Hi. I see so many familiar faces. Um, thank you so much for, for braving this weather and coming out tonight for this extraordinary event. I know that there's nothing like a rainstorm in Los Angeles. It's the equivalent of a, of a level five blizzard on the East Coast. Um, but this is, you'll be happy you came. The literary world is very small, and once you're, you've been in it for a while, you tend to know people through their work, and, and it's a small world, as you know, as readers and writers. Um, in this case, I know Evgenia Sitkowitz. I've known her for a very, very long time. When I was in my early 20s working at the Paris Review, Evgenia was my intern. I don't know if Alyssa from the Daily Bruin is here, but she was asking Evgenia and I, oh, when was it you were both at the Paris Review? Was it 10 years ago or 15? <laughs> and <laughs> Evgenia, being scrupulous, told her it was, it was more like 35. But um, Evgenia was at the time, I think, a teenager in school and was already perspicacious in her reading of the, of the manuscripts that came in. And I believe... I believe you picked out a story or two that we, we ended up publishing, which is very, very rare. Anyway, she went off. She was English. She was studying. She went off. And years later, we found each other again when her first book of short stories, Ether, came out, which is a, a beautiful collection of seven very wry, funny, insightful gems of short stories. And then we had dinner one night years ago, and she told me the plot of the novel, which is which I liked when I heard it, but I, I wasn't in any way prepared until I read The Shades, which I received in, in Galley. And I'm just gonna read you a couple of a couple of comments that have been made about this extraordinary first novel. This is by Hilton Owls, who as a, as you all know is a of the Pulitzer Prize winning critic and author of White Girls. Evgenia Sitkowitz's The Shades is not a first novel. It is a tour de force, a powerful, wicked, compassionate, and beautifully written account of the dangers we keep in our head and heart, including love. Sitkowitz, a master of mood, alters our vision of what fiction is or should be by altering our perception of its possibilities in page after glorious page in the startling and startlingly original book. And then another, another accolade from one of my favorite writers as well, James Lasden, who's also read right here in our series. Evgenia Sitkowitz has written a haunting novel about love and loss that moves fascinatingly back and forth across the borderline of reality and myth. Her bold youth of the cultured English upper middle class is the setting for a savage reimagining of Orpheus Eurydice mar marks her out as a gifted original writer. Um, this novel is, it, it acts as both a realistic novel about grief and loss and also a fable and a ghost story in, in the manner of, of Henry James's great ghost stories. Um, so welcome. I'm not going to give away too much. Here's Evgenia Sitkowitz reading from The Shades. that lovely introduction, Mona. I was in awe of you then, and I still am. Nothing changes. I'm going to read a chapter that takes place a year and a half after the death of a 16-year-old, Rachel, and is about her family, her mother, Catherine, father, Michael, and her brother, Rowan, and others. The settings, England, um, the the chapter opens outside an old country house that has been divided into apartments. Catherine was outside Hamdeen when she first saw the girl. A red BMW deposited her, made a quick U-turn, and drove off at such a speed that Catherine thought 
but if she was ever to see the car again, she would be sure to give its idiot driver a bollocking. From a distance, she sized up the young woman, slight but not athletic, rounded shoulders, poor posture. Apparently, no one had ever told her that she needed to stand up straight. Her dark, choppy hair was pushed back in an Alice band and tufted up behind. No sleek amber mane. The girl didn't seem to register her, but instead rummaged inside a bag to find sunglasses and put them on, raising her head in the general direction of the house. The bag she carried was the same slouchy, unstructured kind that Rachel liked, although this hadn't always been her taste. When Rachel was eight, she had become attached to a stiff 50 snap purse that had belonged to Catherine's mother and had refused to go anywhere without it. Catherine remembered the age it took for her to assemble its contents, crayons, plastic animal, before she was ready to make a gap-toothed promenade, her ladylike accoutrement swinging over one small arm. She turned away, wishing that Judith would give her pa patients better directions so they did not come by and bother her. This was precisely why she didn't like going out. That morning, Catherine had moved 20 stacks of mail from the dining room, where it had been sitting an unwanted visitor, to the kitchen, where it could no longer be avoided or ignored. The sight of so many unopened letters was daunting, as each one represented an unspoken demand. Michael had offered to come down to help, but she had insisted on leaving it to do in her own time. It was important to hang on to the last semblance of competence. Besides, to become accustomed to being alone. She made a cup of Judith's muddy tea, ignoring complex brewing instructions, dunking the pouch, chucking it away. She managed a surprisingly efficient pre-sort, soon determining that most of the mail was junk and could be tossed without opening. Personal correspondence was easily identified. She recognized the determined hand of Paige, doubtless full of attention and useless prescription. There was little chance that Catherine would get involved with another foundation, take up meditation, tai chi, or zumba. Anything that looked as though it might contain a condolence was put aside to be opened at some future date. As she had discovered, sympathy did nothing for her. She didn't need it, nor did she want it. She also made a start on her electronic backlog, pulling up pages upon pages of unopened bold that seemed to glare out at her. Reproach from her inbox was mutual. She resented the messages for presuming on her time when she had no interest in reading them. She made the decision that emails could wait another day. Now that contact had been reduced to essentials, everyone who mattered knew to telephone, or in Rowan's case, text. And Lewis called only when there was something she absolutely needed to know. This pared down existence, the habit of ignoring anything extraneous, was beginning to seem like an economical use of time. As she hadn't been to the gallery in months, it was just as well that most of her business had devolved upon the administration of artists' estates, with only one group show planned for later in the year. It was also good that Lewis had become so adept at keeping it all going in her absence. One of her better decisions was turning out to have been the hiring of Lewis, the son of a prominent American literary agent who had transplanted to London. Lewis had been raised in the UK and was now indistinguishable from any young Englishman who had been to Stowe and the London School of Economics, having turned from a career in economics to art with a realization that the two were not mutually exclusive. He was subtle and polite, persuasive but not pushy. She'd once observed him with a collector looking at Camden School gouache and credited him for knowing exactly what to say, something scholarly about Matisse's decoupé followed by something subjective, and she'd like the way he'd known to withdraw in a timely manner, allowing the collector to bond with the picture and fall in love. Being front man suited Lewis. He was making it easier for her to opt out, and he was benefiting from the exchange. That she would have left the gallery to a subordinate for more than one week would have been inconceivable at any time before the accident. Having devoted 20 years to a business that manifested a vision of what was relevant and mattered, she managed every detail and left nothing to chance. No one else could have replicated her interaction with artists and clients, which was always specific and direct. In terms of her professional development, certain relationships were more significant than others. No association had been more formative or important to her than with the artist John Bramley. 
She'd been sent to see him by her boss, Jay Katz, to check progress on five paintings that were overdue for delivery. She was a novice then, having worked at Katz Inc. only two months, hired straight from the front desk at Christie's, where she'd been seated after finishing her master's. Jay had told her he'd recognized in her a look of a hungry cub. She considers herself lucky to have been given the task, even knowing all the different levels of responsibility the vis visit involved. There was Pleasing Cats, a maverick on the contemporary art scene whose entry to London from New York and brash pricing was causing unrest among, amongst his competitors in Cork Street. There was Satisfying Herself, unlikely by her own exacting standards, and there was Impressing the Artist, a formidable talent but an unknown quantity personally. All she knew about the man was that he'd been married three times. His first wife had left him for another woman, his second for his first dealer, she didn't know much about his third wife, also an artist said to have been very beautiful until her looks were ravaged by alcohol. At the time of Catherine's visit, John's work had been undervalued in the marketplace, but perception of him was quickly changing thanks to representation by cats and entry into key collections, resulting in rapid leaps in the prices he commanded. She was two hours late for the meeting, roadworks, and a 10-mile tailback had turned the drive to his Suffolk cottage into a constipated crawl. In her apologies to the master, she never could bring herself to admit that she'd added another 30 minutes to the journey, circling a labyrinth of unsignposted lanes and hedgerows, wishing she'd been sensible enough to bring a map. He lived on a working farm, not unlike her parents' home in Sussex, only Catherine's father, a potter, had converted all the outbuildings to make a compound for local craftsmen and had rented the fields to a neighbor for grazing. Sweet hay and rancid silage were the smells of childhood, but the familiarity did little to soothe nerves aggravated by the journey. John Bramley was polite to the point of courtliness, pulling up a chair, offering refreshment with the clipped articulations of a Cambridge education. He regarded her with a stark curiosity that bordered on concern, but it didn't take long for her to realize that he wasn't severe, but serious. When he invited her to eat supper, he'd been cooking lamb on a greasy arga when found. Catherine was bold enough to ask to see his studio. He handed her boots for the march across the sodden field to a corrugated, corrugated metal clad structure fitted with skylights that must have been a hay barn once. Inside, inside were four large abstract landscapes executed with dark gestural swathes that seemed to sweep all the terror and beauty of existence into the impasto. No less powerful than the big scale canvases was a small oil sketch of lilting rhomboids that drew her attention. Outlined in graphite, three alabaster forms floated on a pale field of striated gray. Unlike the angst and turmoil of the other pieces, the image was magnetically serene. However, the sun was lowering, the artist only worked in natural light. There was no electricity, only a wood-burning stove. Bramley made it clear that he was unhappy for her to look at his paintings this way. They returned to his cottage and drank some burgundy while eating a stew. He plied her with the questions, what kind of man was her partner, a good one? Were they planning to marry? We're on track. The conversation turned to, turned to Constable Matisse Gauguin and his transition from portraiture to expressionism. He caught her off guard by asking why Katz hadn't come to see him himself. The truth was that her boss had stayed behind to receive a collector who was circling a knockout bacon, a newly discovered version of the buggers. The owner of the picture, a friend of Francis's and regular of the colony room, had been persuaded by the wily dealer to release it for condition report giving Jay Katz five days to come up with an over-the-odds, irresistible offer before the picture had to be returned. The gallerists knew from ex experience that when people were separated from their possessions, they were most susceptible to cash offers. He had already lined up three punters, one duke, one government minister, and the manager of a rock band who was likely to trump them both. At first, Catherine had tried to cover for her boss, Jay is truly sorry that he's been detail detained in London before opting for a more direct approach with emissions. He doesn't know if you're working, working and he's worried. So here I am, I came instead. She sounded more upbeat than she'd intended. And he thinks you will magically beguile me into producing more than I have. 
No, of course not, she said, mortified that he would think she would be so crass, although fine with the perception that cats might be. I can only tell you that I will do my utmost to support your immense talents and see it properly represented. She was relieved that he didn't contradict her credo. If Katz has become fat and indolent, he said, I hope the condition has not affected his eyes. With that, he'd raised his glass to her. She was glad to see that he was smiling. He asked her to stay, but she declined, retreating instead to the discomfort of a concave mattress at the local B&B to spend the night wondering whether she'd been presumptuous about the nature of his invitation. Maybe all he'd been offering was a decent bed. Ne the next morning, he'd telephoned her early. Instead of returning to the studio, he wanted to show her a place of greater significance. He picked her up and drove her 10 miles to Sutton Hoo, where an excavation had been in progress intermittently since 1939. The site seemed to lie in supplication to the sky, skinless and exposed with its topsoil scraped away. Most of the burial mounds had been restored and allowed to grass over once again, while those still under examination gaped open like cystic wounds. Bramley was a familiar on the scene. He was on first named terms with archaeologists and researchers alike and afforded the privilege of circulating unsupervised. With one hand on Catherine's elbow, the other daubing the direction of points of interest, he guided her around while speaking of the venerable Miss Pretty, who had owned the land and lived in the austere White House across the field. Miss Pretty had been interested in spiritualism. After hearing reports of supernatural activity in the area, she'd funded the first excavation that yielded the monumental discovery of King, of King Redwald's ship with its troves of chattels and treasures. When John had taken her to see the grim figures of the Sandmen, where they lay hunched and undefended in their pits, like those caught in the molten lava of Vesuvius, they looked as though they might have been buried alive. She'd had the impression that he was posing some sort of question by bringing her there, but was at a loss to know what it was. He seemed to intuit her thoughts. I come here often to visit my neighbours, the ones that came before. Each hill and rut belongs to them and echoes with their call. They remind me what it means to be alive. His connection with the ancient dead was startling. Equally, the clarity with which he seemed to be looking at his own mortality, even challenging it with a willful stare. As she stood by, the rhomboid abstract that she had glimpsed in the studio came to her, allowing her to understand what the image represented, a preoccupation with places of interment, past, present, future. For Catherine, the insight was profound, so disarming that she stepped back, as if to stay too close to the trench's edge, she might be propelled down there in the direction of his gaze. That she had revealed himself to her was an act of trust, a vote of confidence that braced an 18-year bond. She went on to co-curate one more show for him with Katz, then another independently as his sole dealer. Her final tribute to John Bramley was the organization of a museum retrospective, fulfilling the promise she had made to him the day that they met. She had been warned about the first anniversary, that it was a mistake to think that it would push her one day further away from her loss, when it would only bring her one day closer to its permanence. It, it wasn't until the weekend after the first anniversary of Rachel's death that the cold weight of this eternity had flattened her. By force of will, she had made herself get up before she surrendered to the silence. There were different kinds of quiet, not all bad. There was the fertile kind of artists which she knew from studio visit visits and enjoyed. She liked the economy of speech, that words came from seeing. Conversation only happened when there was something to say. Silence was always productive, full of ideas and crowded with consciousness. John Bramley was famously taciturn. Over the years, he'd unnerved many a sitter, although in the evening, in the company of friends, when work was done and his brushes were down, he would exhale and expand like the burgundy in his decanter and become confidential and downright talkative. Her father was the same when he was making. He didn't speak much or waste time with small talk or chatter. When Catherine appeared in the shed, he'd hand her a lump of clay in lieu of conversation, and hours would pass while she watched him etching and molding, 
making glazes that were alchemical in their ability to fire from dull colors into iridescent hues, with barely a word passing between them. And that was fine too. Once, seeing her anticipation, he cautioned her that for all his experience, he never could be sure that a ceramic would survive a double firing. Sometimes, for reasons unknown, air pressure, water quality, mineral composition, composition of the clay, a piece would emerge from the kiln fissured or broken. He likened the pale beast square on the shelf lined up for passage through the infernal heat to souls waiting for a chance of eternity. These variables aside, he told her that art only happened when labor, intention, and craft came together. You can toil all you want, and the object of your attention is ugly, but with one brave turn, it can become rare and beautiful. To an outsider, that looks like a flick of the wrist, but I warrant you, it's not. In spite of all the hours spent in the studio receiving so many wisdoms, she developed, she, she developed no talent for the medium and did little more than toy with the clay. His processes, processes were far more interesting to watch. She did like to coil and made legions of snails. Another escargot, he'd ask, indulging her, and she'd nod and set about making yet another pinwheel mollusk. Only when she reached a precocious 11 did she force questions about his pottery that was mostly sold in gift shops. How much did a tea set cost to make? How much did he charge? She noted that one teapot was really three pieces, but by the time he'd made the body, attached the handle, made the lid. Then there were those pesky cups. Why didn't he make a jug or a vase that would be quicker than he could make and sell more? She'd observed with some anxiety that money was tightly passed. Her father laughed, praising her acumen. Taking a lump and mass of clay to the wheel, he raised a cylinder as only a conjurer could do. Our experiment, dear girl, big enough for flowers, a Catherine jug, what color should it be? Blue, she'd replied. What shade? be more exact. Anything but navy should smack the box pleats of an offending uniform skirt. What would you have against navy? Boring. He allowed the wheel to slow to a halt. Ah, no mystery. I agree it appears a little solid. Color comes from light. What you see depends on how many wavelengths the object can absorb or reflect and send back to the eye. You mean the color isn't there? This information was disorienting as it flipped her understanding of the physical world on its head. That brain of yours decides, do you think gray could pass muster? Only if it has blue in it. The mist. With a deft press of the thumb, a spout appeared on the rim. You're not alone in your passion. Centuries ago, people crossed seas, climbed the mountains of Afghanistan to find precious stones of lapis lazuli to grind into pigment to make the most profound and sacred of blues, ultramarine. Was it expensive? More valuable than gold because it was rare and prized by all the master painters. He slid a piece of wire under the jug, neatly slicing it from the turntable. Are there any blues you'd find acceptable? Are there any other blues you'd find acceptable? His voice was clipped she sensed that he hadn't liked her question. The sky when it's sunny, the sea in photos when it's clear, baby blue, the turquoise rings. When Rachel was born, her eyes were blue, but turned brown. Rowan's were the same, then a curious gray flecked with moss green. Irish twin, why did she ever think that was funny? Her father started calling her Manager Catherine, which she didn't find as amusing as he seemed to do. But she was pleased when she heard that the jug had sold for the same price as the more labor-intensive tea set. Then there was her mother's silence that began after the episode, a chill that hardened into a freeze, fragile enough to chatter at any moment. Rosemary Hall hadn't always been so brittle, as a younger woman, she was mild and conscientious. She managed the farm and the family, family's tenuous finances, supervising Catherine's homework, attentive to the details, the minutiae of her needs. The only hint of the forecast might have been her mother's hovering air of anxiety 
but as she lived, lived in perpetual wait, whether for rents from tenants who never paid on time, like her husband, they were artisans surviving sale by sale, or for her husband to emerge to receive pieces that would be packed in newspaper and loaded into the shuddering Morris Minor for distribution around local gift shops, a certain apprehensiveness could have been perfectly natural. That her mother was capable of a singular, singularly destructive act at first sight seemed not just unlikely, but impossible. The episode in question involved a commission from Kitty Lyle, who owned an Elizabethan jewel house and garden on the West Sussex border. Mrs. Lyle had cultivate, cultivated a sculpture garden of Moore, Hepworth and Carrow at Rother Park with a small but choice collection of ceramics inside. She had seen one of Frank's vases at a craft show, made inquiries about its maker and discovered that he was somewhat local. After inviting Frank Hall to view her galleries, she commissioned a work as a present to herself for her 60th birthday. Many vessels fell on his wheel before this beauty could rise, more delicate than his usual weightier stoneware, but still wide and generous in proportion. It had a lusted serpent chasing around the rim over a body burnished with oxidized rings of hot gold. The day he presented the vase as complete, Catherine thought she had never seen such a radiant and cosmic glaze, nor her father so proud. Her mother denied having touched it. She claimed that when she'd walked in, she'd found it already smashed on the stand. Don't come near my studio. Tell her about your girlfriend's money. Stupid woman, I would pay to do what I do. You do pay. A replacement was made, but it lacked the planetary curves of the original. The new version had the look of a lesser reproduction. Her father still received generous pay payment for the commission, but there was no compensa compensa compensation for the creative frustration that dogged him beyond the incident. With every failed attempt to reacquaint craft with inspiration, the pile of rejects burgeoned in the yard. Catherine reckoned that these objects had been abandoned with good reason as they were eerily deformed. When she said as much, asking her father to move the dump somewhere else, he barked, get used to it, young lady, it's permanent. I wouldn't think of moving it any more than I'd try and move Pompeii. Seeing his daughter's bewilderment, he told her to look up Vesuvius in the encyclopedia, which she did to no immediate understanding. It was many years before she could wrap her mind around the analogy and figure out who was the victim and who was the volcano and determine that her parents were a confusing mix of both. Gradually, time and the elements worked a metamorphosis on the heap with mold and leaves unifying the wreckage into one great hopeless masterwork that seemed to cry out with the burden of defeat. With her father's anger subsiding into disappointment, grave enough to cast a pall over the household, the absence of any further denial of the breakage acted as confirmation of his wife's guilt. Whether she'd been given cause for provocation was less certain. That the relationship between artist and patron had made her insanely jealous was clear. But whether she'd been given grounds for suspicion was harder to establish. It never occurred to Catherine to ask that would have been indelicate and to breach a boundary containing things too personal to discuss. After the incident, Catherine was taken to Rother Park by her father and was finally introduced to the infamous Kitty. Instead of meeting a femme fatale, she discovered an, an old lady in coral linen with platinum hair and only a faint glimmer of glamour. She had greeted Catherine's father in a vague but friendly manner He'd still, still managed to look dusty, even though he'd washed and changed before going out. Catherine was sorry that Mrs. Lyle hadn't paid her more attention and recognized her special, specialness, but instead wasted time talking to everyone else who happened to be in the garden. In terms of revealing the lover's complicity, the meeting was inconclusive. However, because her father had been paid well over the odds by Mrs. Lyle, tell her about your girlfriend's money, she could see how easily that could be construed as a sign of a special relationship and fed into Catherine's mother's jealousy, justified or irrational. A likely scenario was that without the tools to temper a coiling tension, she became so tightly wound that she snapped. Her mother broke things. In another household, it might have been a saucer or coffee mug. 
In hers, it was trust and an Olmec and Etruscan influence bell crater. She snapped because you can. After the incident, her father made his own deliveries, and once Mr. Derlacher came to the farm to pick up a box, Catherine never saw or wondered what was inside. By then, the eruptions of puberty were more compelling than her parents' intrigues. With her mother retreating behind a carapace of unhappiness, Catherine's prayers that she might get away from her parents and their shambolic farm were miraculously heard when she was told she was going to board full-time at school. She never asked how the fees would be paid. That might have been to, to discover that a mistake had been made and there was no money for her to go. Applying a similar instinct to that of the school fees, Catherine never brought up the subject of the vase. Avoiding questions was the best way of avoiding unpalatable answers, she quickly learned. Catherine received different explanations of her mother's passing when she drowned on her 55th birthday, swimming in calm seas at Canberra Sands, ranging from, your mother did it to fuck us up, her father, to, poor Rosie's heart must have given out, Catherine's maternal aunt. Catherine was at university when she heard the news. She returned home to find her father drunk, alternating grief and with anger. He railed against his dead wife, claimed that her death had been a hostile act. She baked me a cake and left it on the table with tea. No note, Kath. She couldn't bring me down in life, so she'd bring me down with death. Catherine was too stunned to know what to believe. In the absence of any psychiatric or medical evidence, the coroner ruled her mother's death an accident. With a person she, who would... With the person she would normally look to for answers gone, she was left hollow and weightless, as if her core had been ripped out and her center of gravity missing. She no longer recognized herself or her father. With her mother's act, they became strangers to each other, unreliable witnesses for having no clue or knowledge of what had been going on. In search of a place that would still be familiar, Catherine went back to university after the funeral. She didn't want to be around her father and listen to his spewings. To stop and mourn the opaque woman who had been her mother would have been to comprehend and absorb something of her pain. The best she could do was launch back into her studies and finish her dissertation and hope that whatever had happened, her mother hadn't suffered at the end. With Rowan gone and from the recesses of a darkened room, Catherine had a better understanding of what it was like to have been her mother. Like a caring companion, her own frailty had brought with it a more keenly developed compassion for her mother as she tried to fathom the anguish that had take, driven her to take her life. What had been her mental state before she died? Was she aware that she was suicidal? Had she deliberately concealed her intentions? Now that she was five years away from the age that her mother had been when she died, Catherine saw similarities in herself, but mostly differences. Whereas Catherine had sought solitude as a solace, her mother's isolation had been different. It hadn't been a choice for her. Loneliness had only brought her despair. There were other distinctions. Unlike her mother, she was making an effort in case Rowan came home. She was doing it alone because she didn't want the help of bereavement counselors. She had consulted them about Rowan and they had failed to recognize her son's vulnerability. In doing so, they had misadvised and betrayed her. The morning of the accident, they left the hospital and returned home. As it was still early, there was nothing for them to do except for wait for Rowan to wake. They hadn't wanted to disturb him before and interrupt his last innocent sleep. At 6.30 a.m., they heard stirrings in his room and had gone in to find him sitting at his computer. When he looked up, his placid eyes were already knowing. Catherine had managed to stop crying, but only for a moment. Rowan allowed her to hang ragdoll limp in his arms while she blurted out the news, accepting the information without any reaction. Michael later said that he was proud of his son's presence of mind and consoling strength, also that he seemed to know his limits, because when it was time, he'd walk them out of the room and close the door behind them. Thirty minutes later, Rowan was downstairs in his uniform, ready for school, refusing entreaties to stay home or be driven. He'd insisted on taking the bus as usual and left the house with his earbuds in, just as if it were any ordinary day. A 
The call to the headmaster confirmed that he was indeed there and was to all outward appearances fine. On the way to the funeral, Rowan announced that he wanted to read at the service. The stoicism of this request had taken both parents by surprise. After the priest intoned the service, Michael read Psalm 23 and Amazing Grace was sung. Rachel's school friend, Charlotte Nestor, took her turn to go to the lectern to speak. She told the congregation that Rachel had standards before any of her group knew what that meant, that she had an, an annoying tendency to always be right, but this made her the best person to turn to for advice. In opposing teams for debate, Rachel had taken her aside and said, if I win, it's not personal, which made being thrashed in front of the whole school, school seem more right. She spoke of her loyalty. When mum was ill, she came with me to the hospital. When mum died, I remember Rachel saying, that's bloody awful, and bursting into tears. Charlotte looked to the heavens, mugging slightly. Sorry, Lord, for saying bloody. Oh my God, that's twice. Her last Facebook status was, life equals insane plus beauty. She was right. The beauty is that she existed. The insanity, the bloody awful part, is that she's gone. Her voice cracked. I'm just so grateful to have known her. The younger contingent burst into applause. Catherine saw that many of them were sobbing. She was moved by poor Charlotte and remembered the shockwave waves Sue Nestor's cancer had sent through her own family. She would never forget Jack Nestor's broken appearance at his wife's funeral and her own embarrassment in the face of his loss at being helpless to do anything to relieve his suffering. She'd seen the same pitying looks and shame on faces when she'd entered the church, as if she had a terminal disease that was public knowledge, but there was nothing more that could be done. No cure for being tired after driving from the country, having been out late at a party for a Chinese photographer in London the night before, because the Asian market was the fastest growing area of contemporary art, and at the time that seemed so terribly important. No remedy for not following her instinct to say no to her daughter and saying yes, because it was so much easier than arguing the point. No absolution for being permissive when it suited her and strict when it did not and for being the type of mother who passes for competent, but is in truth neglectful. Charlotte's bovine face was flushed with the effort of public speaking. She was trying so hard to honor her friend that she had the quality of an actress who had just nailed a part and was giving it her all. Although there was a lot of childish eye in her speech, there was a brightness to her description that Catherine envied making her question whether her own memories were already starting to fade. She asked herself what kind of mother she had been, taking Rachel to ballet before she could walk, to gymnastics before she could run. She remembered the fatigue of being with a tired and hungry child after school, and that when Rachel had become serious about tennis and rowing for a while, she had made the au pair do the driving. Catherine helped with projects on the weekend, but only if they interested her. Most often she was in the gallery or racing up to see John Bramley in Norfolk. Rachel hadn't told her about Mirren or any of her other boyfriends. For all she knew, there might have been many. She had once asked her whether there was anyone she liked but had been met with a scathing gaze, as if I would tell you. The images of Rachel were blurred, but she, she realized that it wasn't her memory that was at fault. It was because during Rachel's short life, she hadn't been present enough to see. Then Rowan took his turn walking up to the altar. The sight of him by his sister's coffin was a double affront. Someone had propped a tennis racket there. Rachel had been a talented player, one of the few selected to participate in the Way to Wimbledon program sponsored by the club requiring long hours of training seven days a week to the sacrifice of all her other extra extracurricular activities. She saw her own hubris that she had harbored so many hopes and ambitions for her daughter when all along this had been her destiny. Such efforts seemed wasteful now, and she wondered whether she should have encouraged her to spend more time at home with friends relaxing instead of putting her on a relentless treadmill. 
perhaps the pressure had made her reckless, literally driven her to make foolish choices. She wanted to take the racket and smash it over the altar, smash the false hope of resurrection, cry and show God what punishment really meant. But that wouldn't have been appropriate. I wrote this poem, Rowan said. There was a collective holding of breath. Everyone was still in anticipation except Michael, who squeezed her hand. That was the title, Rowan continued, deadpan. Everyone laughed, grateful at the release of tension, although Catherine wasn't sure that this had been Rowan's intention. He didn't smile. He continued at a measured pace. Six years pass. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sixteen years pass. Is there a better way? Or are we still the same? Then, without making eye contact with anyone, Rowan walked back to his seat. In contrast to the emotional release after Charlotte's speech, the congregation was nonplussed and silent. Then there was a polite rustle of movement, a fidgeting of programs and murmur, as if people felt obliged to react because to remain quiet might have seemed hostile or rude. Michael leaned in and whispered encouragingly, not bad, almost a haiku. Catherine could have kicked him for being so naive. She thought that if Rowan was going to bother getting up there, he could have at least found something nice to say about his sister. Is there a better way, seemed to imply criticism of her, maybe of them all. Michael's interpretation of the poem was different. He thought his son's words were about as philosophical and inspirational as you could expect a 15-year-old boy's to be. The day after the funeral, Rowan made another announcement. He informed his parents that he wanted out of London and to go away to school. In the context of his odd, affectless behavior, that he had yet to show one iota of sadness, his sudden declaration was alarming and seemed another way for Rowan to repress his feelings and run from his grief. Catherine took the news the hardest. The idea that Rowan would go away from home at a time of crisis to a strange situation where he might not be supported seemed a terrible one, and Catherine strenuously resisted the notion. But Rowan insisted on going. He even made arrangements with himself, applying to a co-ed school outside Canterbury, where he was offered a provisional place subject to parental consent. In the face of such determination, Catherine and Michael reluctantly agreed to consult three therapists and abide by majority rule. Best of three opinions, they said, believing no sane person would fail to take their side. After two meetings, they were overruled. The consensus was that as long as Rowan stayed in therapy, it was all right for him to go. His desire to leave was a way of taking charge of his emotions at a time of helplessness. The need to carve out his identity beyond the arena of mourning was positive. Basic survival, one of them had said. Catherine was, was forced to submit. She didn't want to be accused of selfishly keeping him at home or using him as a crutch but she believed that these experts had seriously underestimated the benefits of keeping the family together and were surprised by their failure to see what this meant. Two years before, when she had told Paige about plans for Hamdine, her friend had asked, are you sure? The rural idyll sounds all very lovely for small children, but now they're dreadful teenagers. Don't you want to stay in London where you can get them out of your hair? You'll go mad in the country and the children won't want to come. Catherine had dis dismissed her as being negatively disposed. But it was ironic to think that in many ways, for different reasons, Paige had been right. Shutting her laptop, she shuffled out through the back door to the garden. She had to remind herself to lift her chest and feet and walk properly. It was hard to believe that she'd been athletic once, center position netball, team undefeated, then Pilates twice a week, where had she found the energy or time? Open post, check your email, walk a little, all the days. Crossing the grass, she followed the property line, keeping her gaze averted from the parcel of putting green of the sportsman's lodge, absurdly manicured against the wild meadows on either side. 
The day was overcast with only a few squibs of sunlight filtering through. Even so, she saw how the rays warmed the hawthorns for a moment before the cloud drifted into the light. She could see how tenderly the leaves were budding. They were vibrant, keen youngsters clambering over a hoary grandmother. Her heart ached again. She never used to look at nature this way, only if it was in a picture or representation in a Reesdale or Constable. This was another cruel irony of loss, that she could be half a person and the part that remained could become so much more acute. Her thoughts were interrupted by the red car and its misplaced passenger. She turned away and then turned back as she decided to, to retreat the m most direct way inside by crossing the grass to the front door. This had been the original entrance with recessed ionian pillars and a pelmet weighted with a woven mass of wisteria on the surround. She noticed that the wisteria too was budding, but the stems were smooth and lithe. On their first visit after exchanging contracts with the seller for Hamdine, Michael had warned her not to get too attached to the lovely blossoms. They were invasive and compromising the brickwork and fenestrations and destined for the chop. The children had been with them at the time, always alert to Michael's uncool general foginess. They'd howled with laughter and teased him all the way on the drive back to London. Dad, would you open the fenestration, please? Did you know, Dad, that the eyes are the fenestrations of the soul? Michael didn't mind being the butt of the joke as long as no one was being unkind. Glad you lot are so easy to please, he said gamely. He couldn't resist a historical reference to justify his choice of vocabulary with a digression into the 17th century religious struggles in Bohemia and the second defenestration of Prague where Protestants hurled a scribe and two Catholic, Catholic regents from a tower and thus precipitated the Thirty Years' War. Rachel's takeaway from the, from the lecture was delight in the verb defenestrate. I can't believe there's such a buff and excellent word for throwing someone out of the window. Her reaction irked Rowan, who told his sister to stop using trendy expressions. What did buff mean? What was she trying to say? The discussion became semantic, with Catherine weighing in that buff was a neutral color and something you did to your car and nails. Her husband agree, agreed that it was a kind of polishing, but it could be stretched to mean shining example, so her use wasn't totally out of line. Rachel was quick to crow to her brother, completely appropriate, see? With Rowan deadpanning, that's cut, I'm blown. More Rachelisms triggering another round of debate. Catherine missed their banter, the sustaining humor that balanced their frustration and kept them all in check. Her children had given her much in the way of equilibrium. She wished she could say that she had done the same for them. When Michael had sentenced the wisteria, Catherine had wholeheartedly agreed. She was as pragmatic as her husband. To be sentimental about a plant that would eventually undermine would have been bloody stupid. Looking again at the vines, two on the right, winding across to greet a smaller one on the left, she saw them as determined graces, more vigorous and alive and worthy of a reprieve than the staunchly inanimate facade that was little more than a shell. She decided to tell Michael that he should lay off the wisteria. A girl's voice close by. Sorry to bother. I used to live here. That, that introduces the main characters of the book in a wonderful way. You know, hearing you read this time, it struck me a lot has been a lot has been said about ours being sort of the second generation of of female writers who really write about about motherhood and children. Um, of course, literature is one of those few fields where women did have a huge presence in the 19th century, but most of the 
the women we read, Jane Austen, George Eliot, were childless. And it's, it's striking, it's striking to hear, I, I, I didn't think of this as much when I was reading it, but there's so much about her guilt, her ideas about the way we read as children now, and, and her guilt being linked to this tragedy. Was that something you were thinking of as you developed the plot? Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, she is is someone who is has a lot of ambivalences, and um, and at this point in the story, she's actually able to see um, see how her actions have have um, the ramifications of of the kind of parent she was. Um, I mean, I think that that um, she. I, th I think in such a in such a situation, you know, guilt um, would be Expected, whatever you've done w yeah. w would be w would be part of it, and and that's a kind of, in a way, a kind of magical thinking to think that you actually have con more control over uh, you know of events than you you do. Um, um, yes, I mean, I I, I think it's. I felt that it was actually it was important to see, you know, motherhood represented with all its kind of um, deficiencies and <laughs> and um, or problems and, yeah. and, and 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 problems and um, and also joys. You know, it's not without you know. Yeah, that love. scene that it, scene in the car with the kids joking about their father's foginess. And, in calling windows fenestration. That's great. Yes, and that's, that, that's, as she says, you know, it's part of you know, her equilibrium. She relies on her children as much as they rely on her. Um, I was thinking of, of sort of the first generation of women to write about, about having children. And Alice, so much of Alice Munro, mm -hmm. in so much of Munro, it's kind of the children versus sexuality. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this book, it's much more, she's much more sort of torn the children versus work, which is interesting. Yes, and um, she, uh, um, I mean, that sort of relates to her uh, own kind of drive to serve, um, you know, probably goes deep back to her relationship with her father, you know, as a child of an artist, somehow always trying to serve this kind of figure. Um, and, he's and I such think she, an intriguing figure, too, because he's so tender with her and yet there's the, the odd and, and strange... he pushes her yes he sort of pushes her as well yeah and, and then there's the odd strange uh, dynamic with the mother yes there, there, there is um, um, and and her not understanding it and how it it uh, it, it uh, undermines her sense of herself because um, you know in the as I said you know she becomes a sort of unreliable witness to her own life that um, that it's almost that she can't trust anything because she, because of this kind of um, fundamental important relationship that she hadn't understood. Um, but but um, when I was reading uh, when I was writing this, I I read uh, Eleanor Ferranti's story of the lost daughter. Oh yeah. Which is n not the story of the lost child, which is you know the similar. Title. It has two books. Wait, the lost daughter is is it, the is the earlier one where the doll is at the beach. Yes, exactly. Are you all, and have any of you have uh, no doubt have also seen the 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 TV series now? That oh, I haven't seen it. My brilliant friend. There's it's oh, it's, sorry, it's yeah. now up. Yeah, but, uh, but this is an earlier book of hers. Yes, and 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 I thought the the way I mean she represents. Um, Ambivalence extreme. I mean, it's um, I, she's so uncompromisingly um, obsessive. Uh, yes, and 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 I, I thought that was you know it's actually refreshing to see the whole um, the, all, all, all the different um, colours of of femalehood, not not just the the wholesome yeah. ones. I thought you did a very interesting thing with the voice as well in this novel. I mean, I couldn't, does, I, I don't know how you felt hearing it, but I, 
we don't know if he if the father was having an affair with Mrs. Lyle. We don't know whether she deliberately broke the mm-hmm. vase. It's it's carefully balanced. Did you come across did did that come to you at the beginning of the novel or was that something that developed that that voice that that doesn't fall to one side or the other in a way? Well, I tried to walk a line from a kind of a subjective reality and an objective reality. So and to see how sort of elastic I could make that line. So um I I um I thought it was um kind of true to life in some way that you know th- that everything is is subject to a, an interpretation and um and w- we see what we want to see and we understand what we can understand or want to understand and um so I thought I thought that you know this that this story has a lot of mystery in it and mm. I um you know it has, it's about the the mysteries of you know the the psyche and and the mysteries of relationships and and um um so I I felt that sort of treatment suited the material mm. in um and I also believe that I, I think reading is a creative act and so leaving um, some room for the reader to kind of make, make their own um, decisions about what? just to make their, t- to form their own impressions. Mm. Yeah, there are many mysteries to be decided. But yeah. Yes. Can you talk a little about the development of the novel? You'd written short stories before. Did this start as a short story, and did it come in the structure that you it ended up with, or did you, can you talk about how it came to be for you? How long did you work on it? Well, I I always knew it was going to be a longer story. I I thought it was going. I I knew um, it was going to uh, it was going to be a long story, and um, and I tried not to worry too much about you know what it what it was, was it a novella or was it going to be a novel and I just and it seemed to find its natural length uh, although um, my editor did have me um, expand, flesh it out the family in particular and that was I think a great um, a a good thing for the book and um, so it took many years it's it's like how long we've been, how long we've known each other. Most I almost <laughs> don't want to say. Um, it hasn't been that long. I th- it, well, it has. It, it has. It took a good part of six years, and I think when I said that uh, as a reading, someone actually gasped. And <laughs> <laughs> um, um, try writing one. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Advice to the gaspers. Yeah. So. So, so yeah. Th- so that was. I just s- embarked upon it, and it, and you know, you st- I started very small, as one does, with a um, a premise, and then um, and then, which was you know the idea of uh, s- someone, a person, uh, going back to the place of his, her, their, their youth, and um, and then. Then I set about trying to figure out who those people, who was being visited, who who was, the, who was the visitor, and um, and I went from there. Um, I don't know if any any psychological interpretations have been made, but it's it's interesting too that you wrote this book. It's it's kind of the the maternal horror story of mm-hmm. anyone having a child go off to yeah. College, which you did during in, at some point during the writing of this novel, is that this this girl is is killed in an absolutely accidental death. I mean, the parents have done nothing that we all haven't done. You know, um, they weren't neglectful; they just let her have a sleepover. Yes, exactly. Um, it it is an anxiety. It is a kind <laughs> of parent anxiety book, um, and yes, um, I th- you know, 
I think this is also why we're so invested in the idea of nurture as parents. You know, we think that if we, um, you know, give we our children kind of control, uh, exactly, we 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 will have we will be protecting them. But when actually there's a lot we can't do. There's there's a lot. Um, it, it's kind of wonderful being in the hammer talking about this book because there's so much about about visual art, and Catherine is so vividly and convincingly, persuasively portrayed as as a as an art dealer, and she just is. There's she has such an instinct for what's mm -hmm. great and what's not, and what's best in a particular artist's work. Um, can you talk about? Did you do research? How did, how do you know so much about all that? Well, so, um, to my knowledge of your life, you haven't you haven't been a gallerist. No, I have not been a gallerist, but I spend a lot of time um, looking at art and in galleries and museums, and and um, I kind of keep my eyes open, and um, and I, I do love looking at pictures and paintings, and and I know artists and I know gallerists and curators and um but i just kind of it's just from like listening and seeing mm. but this isn't modeled on anyone i have to say there's no you know <laughs> in case there's um a, yeah definitely i thought Rowan, the, the brother is a is a fascinating character too could you talk a little about him and his awakening as an ecological activist well he you know he's i feel that he's soulful and, and, and high-minded and, and that's something which is innate in him and he, you know, from an early age and, um, and the, this kind of tra tragic event maybe just kind of creates more urgency for him about needing to do something um, to act on his his Concerns, you know, and you know, in, in the story, he he's an environmental activist. He, you know, he's a kind of early um, fledgling, um, a nascent sort of activist, um, and he's very concerned about climate change. And yeah, so um, the husband Michael is a very, very, very intriguing character too. He's so he's so appealing, mm. and He's a sort of ballast to the story. Um, did you? Was it always about equally balanced between them? It's more Catherine's story, but he's he's very strong. I think in the he he. Um, I went after I worked on the um, piece with with my editor. Uh, I. He actually em em emerged as a as a stronger. Hmm. Figure and that actually changed the book. It actually made it, in some ways, m more spiritual. It's actually had a a big of effect. Um, I mean, it, that wonderful by, story just, about his parents. Just that by was bringing great. him, yeah, just by bringing him into focus, it did change the the balance. And um, and he's a kind of fundamentally kind of optimistic person. And. Um, Yes, he, 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 the, the, the first early drafts, he, 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 was, he was more sketchy. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. well, I have, I have she was always there. <laughs> I have much more I could ask, but I do want to ask a little bit about... So you've written short stories, and then you took six years to write this novel. It gasped everybody. Do, do you like, do you like the, the... Which do you prefer? When, do you know what you'll be doing next? Um, I, 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 I have loved writing both. And I, um, I have an instinct to write another novel. Um, I just feel like getting stuck in for the you know the long haul again. <laughs> and yeah, have you begun one? I, I have. It's it's very much the beginning of the the process. But yes, I have. Is there anything you can tell us about it? Just a little bit. Um, not a great deal, but I, I I can tell you that one of the characters lives, I think, across the Wiltshire Corridor. Oh, that's f so <laughs> an L.A. They're novel. not far, yeah. yeah. Well, that's very exciting. Cool. Okay, well, I could, I could talk about this novel all night, but I know you have questions, too. So let's have some questions from the audience, but I'm going to ask you... Um,
we have helpers with microphones, so if you don't mind waiting, who will start? One of Michelle's students, for chance. I know it's hard to break the ice. Michelle gave me some very good notes. I have to tell, just tell her full disclosure. No questions? Oh my goodness, we've never had this happen before. Thank you. Sir. Um, can, can you just describe how you start? How, how do, you, do you, do you sit in a room and say, here's a blank piece of paper and I'm just gonna write now? Or are there moments of inspiration or how does it all work? No, that's how you start with the, the blank piece of paper. And, um, and then it's just kind of ap absolute willfulness where you kind of will these where did this novel start? Did you start with, with Catherine? What did you know when you started this novel? What well, it was just this premise about the house. That, you know, it's funny. In this case, I had a It was a about place. the house. That's fascinating. I had, well, I, well, well, the place of, that was um, someone returning to the place of their youth. And that was, the, that was just the first idea. But then, you know, it became something, you know, which is different, which is, you know, about grief and so many other things. Um, so, yeah, you, you kind of just have to um, just, there's, there's no substitute for just deep thought and endless rumination. <laughs> Do you unplug? Your do devices. Do you unplug your devices? Well, I should more than I do, but um, I, I, you, you have to, yeah, you have to switch off. That's interesting. Next question, please. Uh, was this triggered by anything S seven or eight years ago? The thought and what brought you to That's wanting to write? The, the, the story. Um, yes. Um, I think what happens is you you have you have these vague ideas and then you keep circling them and then the ones you return to um, and then you just kind of keep on returning to them and then you realize that, that they're the, they're the one um, and then um, and you don't know really know what what it means and and that's what happened I mean I just I had this idea and there wasn't an event or a, it was just, you know, wanted to write something that, you know, um, spoke to the, the, maybe the frailty of existence and you know, family life and all the good stuff. Mm. Let's have a, could, could we have a microphone over here, please? Oh, sorry. Next. I, I did think that the, um, the, the her being a gallerist, uh, the the intersection between kind of commerce and, and art was a kind of colourful one, and I thought that was, um, you know, would raise good you know, questions about how art is valued um, and creativity, and I, you know, so that's, you know, something I've been thinking about, and so that's. Why she was a sort of gallerist, and then, the, and then, the relationship between her and her father, you know, being a child of an artist, and what that's like, and then I had that idea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When it came to its structure, did you um, map it out with military precision, or did you opt to enjoy the process of seeing how it was going to unfurl? Mm -hmm. No, no, I don't. I, I do a very broad outline, and it's it's sketchy. And then I, I just proceed, and just keep rewriting as I go, and and I don't go on till I can actually feel satisfied that I can, you know, move on. And and so I kind of figure the structure. Um, out as I go along, but it did become clear that this, there's this kind of looping structure in the book that it was, you know, one that sort of made sense with the story, and um, so I kind of like stuck to that. And that there were times where 
I thought, you know, that I'd really box myself in, but then you just like you stick with it, and then you sort of you're stuck with it. You stick with it, and then you're stuck, and then, <laughs> and then you. <laughs> so I'm very intrigued by the title of the book, and I want to know how that like kind of came about. Uh, the title. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the title, the, sh the shades, um, they're the souls of the dead in ancient mythology, the people who are crossing you know, to the um, underworld. And uh, I felt, um, I had another title, but my edi editor didn't like it. And she encouraged me to think again. And then um, there's a line in the book where there's a, actually a bit in the book where they go and see Orfeo and I, I, um, I t talk about, you know, who, the, the opera by Monteverdi and, you know, that, that um, a bit about the s story of the, the shades. And I kept on, like, tripping over the, the shades every time I read that. And I, um, there are a lot of crossings in the, in the n novel, like, different kinds of crossings. So I thought um, that, that it, was, it was a good, a better title. What was your and first was one that she didn't like? I, um, I didn't want to say, because <laughs> she was right. Okay. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you later. later. Okay. Hi, Evgenia, yeah, it's Michelle. Thank you for a beautiful reading. Um, Thank you, Michelle. I'm wondering when you were writing, I personally you know, always have a book or two on tap that gets it going for me. Um, were there any books that sort of, when you were having a hard time starting or just to get going, that you consistently, or writers that you consistently read or turned to? Um, I, have, I, I think it's, What's often happened is that you stumble across the thing that somehow, um, and it's not the beginning, but it's sort of when you're reading it, when you're in the middle of writing, sorry, that you somehow find something and it just acts as a sort of tonic. It's not um, like the Eleanor, like the story the of Veronica. the lost daughter. Um, that when I read that, I thought, you know, ah, yes, you know, that's that, you know, that's fantastic and it, it um, kind of doesn't embolden me to kind of go the distance and with an uncompromising character and I read all sorts of things that I loved but um, yes you can kind of re I read randomly and in no particular order or there's no method or it's just I pick. A, I, I seem to find things at the right time. I mean, you know, I read Maggie Nelson's Bluet, um, and it was just kind of crystalline and beautiful. And somehow that was a, like a tonic. I was kind of intrigued by the character that by the house. The house itself seems like a character in the story. Mm -hmm. And it's an unusual house. It's not like a kind of house many people would live in. And the idea that it was something else and, and it's kind of this facade. Anyway, I thought you might talk about that. Just uh, that using the yes. house. Yes, and mention that Michael's work as well, since not everyone Yes. Um, yes, M M Mike, um, the, the house is, yeah, is like a, an old country house that has been divided and sub. And they had um, only taken possession of it shortly, actually, before the accident. So they hadn't ever really lived there. And, and they occupy the front portion, which is really like the facade. And I thought, yeah, uh, the fact that it's a sort of old house, I thought, was kind of atmospheric. And I did want a house that had lots of atmosphere and history. And, you know, I think it says, you know, a lot about My Michael and his, he has, um, he used to work at, at sort of English Heritage and, but now, but, but he, um, 
um, then for financial reasons works in real, est real estate. But um, it's kind of like his fantasy. And so there's a sort of meant to be a sort of pathos there and a sort of aspiration and, uh, um, you know, sort of maybe a pretension and, um, you know, it's, but, but it is, it's meant to have this sort of haunted quality. Something very English too, in a way. Yes, it's in the tradition. Yes. I just, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed the book over here. Oh, hi. Yes, yes he was uh, very... Thank uh, you. Yes. And um, I, not to ruin it for anyone, but I was curious if Kira actually happened. Is well, the that's name of the that, girl that's who we meet girl. In this well, that's for you that to. That's really for you to decide. It was up to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The, right. like, yeah. What? It was. Mm -hmm. What did you think? I, I thought she lost her mind. They, she wasn't. Re I mean, the Catherine lost her mind, and Kira was an imagination. I mean, that was my take on. Yes. It. Well, that's that's. That's valid. There's, there's no wrong reading of the book, and I totally appreciate that interpretation. And okay. yeah, all right, thanks. Yeah, oh. that, that that's well said. Um, I also wanted um, the same comment about the house. There was a theme all throughout about excavation, mm -hmm. with the house itself having parts that didn't exist any longer or that were in question, and she went to visit with the artist to the excavation site. Mm -hmm. Then they went as a family to Rome. Could mm -hmm. you talk a bit about how that worked for you? Well, it's, it's really that, you know, just the connection between the, the dead and the living. It's, it's just the kind of constant reminder, you know, that, that they're always with us and, and, and that we can go around and forget them, but they, we also can't. Um, so, um, so every, everyone's sort of haunted in a way, um, and that there's really maybe, you know, sometimes not that much that separates us. Thank you, Evgenia. That was a really beautiful reading. Thank um, you. You said that it take, took six years to write, which I can completely re relate to. But what, what were the stumbling blocks? Were there stumbling blocks, or was it just that you just enjoyed the oh, process? Oh, it's all stumbling blocks. <laughs> yeah. Say more. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, it was... You know, it was figuring out the structure. It was it was quite a difficult structure in the end, and and it's you know it was felt quite it was challenging. I I, I can't really say that much more other than it <laughs> just was um, really challenging to write. <laughs> do you feel that's inevitable, or do you have hopes that the next one? Oh, will I'm be hoping. Yeah, I'm hoping it's a breeze. speed along. <laughs> Do we, I, in the new space, I can't quite see, do we have another, do we have more questions and more microphones dispersed? If it took you six years, it was so beautiful, thank you so much. Did you, do you write every day? I mean, for six years? Uh, or, do no, you have no. day, or do you have days off that you, um, you, you're, you have a sort of mental block or something? Yeah, but I, did, I wasn't thinking. writing solidly for six years. There were, <laughs> there were days, yeah, there were days off and things happen and... Other, other things to do and I also wrote other things and um, and you can get back to it easily um, um, you know, perhaps you get, without yeah, the you, 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 so, and, and then you go back to it yeah, I, I knew I had to finish the book I, I, I knew that I had to see it through there was no question of not finishing it 
Um, it should be said too, I mean, for novels, six years is not extraordinarily long. It's Thank sort you, of Maria. right right in the right in the mean. And and when most novels are you, you figure I mean it it just shows you how much rewriting novelists do because if you wrote a page a day or a half a page a day, you'd be done much faster if you didn't redo things yeah. ten thousand times. True. <laughs> that is true. More questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Evgenia will be um, signing. We have books for sale back here. And where will she? She'll be signing up here. Oh, we have one more question. I'm sorry. But she still will be signing afterwards. I'm, I'm curious uh, about the uh, character development. Like, at what point do you feel like you've done enough per character? Like, how do you gauge that? Hmm. Well, there's a point where, you know, you uh, you kind of can't go any further. There's just like an, a, a, a point, and I mean, sometimes you can only layer in you can only layer in stages, and then you need to be told by someone else that you need to go back, <laughs> and you let someone read it, and then they they point make comments, and then you realise that it's time to dig deep, deep and go back, um, but. There, I think there is a point, you know, when you've done many dra drafts after six years, that y you you realise it starts getting, you start going backwards, and it's it's not getting better, and it's sort of you're chiselling, and it's you're actually undoing, and it's, you're making it worse in some way, and that's the time when you know you're done. I have one another way of asking. Of saying what you're saying, though, is I, just about character. How much about the characters do you know that isn't necessarily on the page? Oh yeah, you, you, I think you have to. You, you you know their past. You know their present, future. You you, you know you have to have figured that every, it all out. So um, you know even, a lot even, more e than so even the small characters. Yeah, yeah it, even the, the the small characters. You 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 have to know it all. Um. Okay, great. So, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so um, much. Evgenia will be here a bit longer, signing books. The books are available over there. And thank great, thank you. This thank was great. Thank you so much, Mona.